This is a short video on Clostridioides difficile infection, also called C. difficile or sometimes just simply C. diff infection. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of C. diff infection. And each of these boxes is color coded according to this legend that you see here at the top right. So I'll be clearing this board and talking through each of these boxes one by one, slowly working our way from etiology to clinical manifestations. Let's get started. At the center of the pathophysiology for C. diff infections is that you have this bacterium, this Clostridioides difficile, that infects and causes inflammation in the colon. Now this bacteria was previously called Clostridium difficile, so I might be saying it backwards, they recently changed the name of the genus, but the species is the same and the um, abbreviation C. diff still works. So we'll call it C. diff or Clostridioides difficile. Now, in order for it to infect and cause inflammation of the colon, you need oral transmission. So in some way, you ate or consumed or had oral transmission of C. diff. Now, this works because C. diff can form spores that are resistant to heat, to antibiotic, and to acid. So these are very resilient spores that end up in your mouth, into your GI tract, where they can proliferate. You can have hospital-acquired infections where you end up getting these spores through contaminated surfaces and medical equipment. You can also have community-acquired fecal-oral route transmission of C. diff. And we'll talk about the many ways that both of these happen. Now, the most common way and the most prominent that you'll probably see in the, ho in the hospital is from recent antibiotics. Some antibiotics cause this more than others. Clindamycin, cephalosporins, and fluoroquinolones are the most common culprits. Penicillins and macrolids also predispose you to C. diff, but not as much as the first three. And all other antibiotics can cause it, but are less likely than the ones I've listed here. And what's going on when you have antibiotics that cause a C. diff infection is that the antibiotics that you're taking for an infection or a wound or some other reason to take antibiotics, they destroy the normal intestinal bacterial flora that normally suppresses C. diff overgrowth. This then allows the C. diff that's normally in your gut, kept in check by your normal gut microbiome, to grow and to grow more than it should to overtake the other bacteria. Um, then when you have oral transmission of some small amount of C. diff, it can kind of spread, infect, take over, and cause inflammation in your colon. Now, antibiotics aren't the only risk factor for C. diff transmission and C. diff spread and infection. There are many other things. In lower SES areas in poorer countries, unsanitary drinking water can predispose you to community-acquired C. diff. Any kind of um, action, iatrogenic or nosocomial or, or whatnot, that suppresses or inhibits your gastric acid can also predispose you to C. diff. The idea is that if you're suppressing your gastric, gastric acid or if it's not working effectively, the uh, oral transmission of spores will more likely get through your gastric acid into your intestines, into your colon, and spread that way. For instance, Proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and other drugs that end in prazole, they suppress your gastric acid, which can make it more likely for those C. diff spores to survive. Enteral feeding, which is feeding into the stomach through a tube, can also bypass most of your gastric acid if it's depositing that food directly into your small intestine, and that can also allow the spores to bypass your gastric acid and make it into your gut. Other risk factors, advanced age and severe illness predispose you to C. diff infections. Recent hospitalizations, of course, can predispose you to C. diff. And note that that's not mutually exclusive from these recent antibiotics. So a lot of times it's hospitalized patients that have been on antibiotics for a week or so. They end up getting diarrhea and getting diagnosed with C. diff. Lastly, immune suppression and inflammatory bowel disease also predispose you to C. diff infections. So now that we have a decent idea of the etiology, let's get into the pathophysiology. Once C. diff or Clostridioides difficile infects and causes inflammation in the colon, what happens next? What exactly does it do? How does it cause damage? It has these two toxins, toxin A, which is an enterotoxin, and toxin B, which is a cytotoxin. And they both cause damage and they both lead to the symptoms of diarrhea and other manifestations. Let's go through toxin A first. Toxin A, the enterotoxin, it binds to the enterocyte brush border. It's then endocytosed into those cells, into the enterocyte cells, where it undergoes a conformational change that exposes an active domain. 
That active domain then allows it to glycosylate some target proteins. I've listed some of them here, RAC, RAC, CDC42, and Rho A. I'm not sure how important those are to remember. It probably has many other downstream effects, but these are the most prominent ones that we've studied. In any case, once it glycosylates these target proteins, they disrupt the cytoskeleton of the enterocytes, which then causes those cells to induce apoptosis, programmed cell death, which directly damages the cells, um, enterocyte death, and it also increases epithelial permeability. So it allow fluid to flow through that epithelial layer, and we'll see how that causes diarrhea in a second. Let's shift our attention to toxin B, um, which is a cytotoxin. This one does the same mechanism as toxin A, so it does this whole endocytosis, glycosylation of protein, disruption of the cytoskeleton, increase epithelial permeability, and inducing apoptosis. It also goes through another mechanism. It forms pores in the endosomal membrane once it's inside the cell. This, of course, leads the endosomal contents to leak out and enter the cytosol, and the endosomal contents are very toxic. Uh, they're very uh, caustic. To the inside of the cell. So that damages the cell and also triggers enterocyte death. And enterocyte death is of course very damaging to your gut and that's what leads to many of your symptoms. The most prominent and most famous symptom of C. diff infection is watery diarrhea. These patients will have at least three stools a day and the stool can have traces of mucus and or traces of occult blood in them. Some uh, medical workers, nurses have claimed that C. diff stool has a characteristic odor I'm not sure if that's true. I've put it on there because it's kind of famous. If you talk to a lot of nurses, they can smell poo in the hallway and say, oh yeah, that's definitely C. diff. I'm pretty sure I've seen studies where that hasn't panned out to be true, but um, I've listed it here just in case it is true. But anyway, the most famous symptom of C. diff is watery diarrhea. That of course can lead to dehydration if the patient doesn't properly have oral fluids or doesn't have an IV that's constantly rehydrating them as they have diarrhea. The enterocyte death can also cause many other symptoms. Patients can have abdominal pain, of course. This abdominal pain can be a diffuse tenderness all across their abdomen, or it could be an intermittent cramping pain associated with peristalsis of the gut. Of course, when you have diarrhea, dehydration, and all this horrible pain, you're not going to be hungry. Patients can have anorexia. They can also have fever and nausea as well. If they don't feel like they want to eat, if they have a lot of inflammation going on, that can cause nausea and fever. Now these are the typical symptoms of C. diff, and in many cases it'll be limited to just this. These symptoms typically occur two to 10 days after initiation of antibiotics. Remember, that was our most prominent etiology of C. diff. There are, of course, complications to C. diff. If it goes untreated or if they have a particularly bad case of it, it can become more severe. So let's get into that next. Enterocyte death in the guts can, of course, cause paralytic Ileus. This leads to new symptoms, including constipation, abdominal distension, and dis diffuse tympany on percussion. This makes sense. If your gut is no longer doing peristalsis, if you're no longer pushing things forward, you're not going to have anything come out of uh, the GI tract, so you might have constipation. Things will start to back up behind the paralytic ileus, which will lead to abdominal distension and diffuse tympany on percussion. The enterocyte death can also cause toxic megacolon, and it's also possible that the paralytic ileus progresses to toxic megacolon. This can have similar symptoms. You can have constipation. You can have abdominal distension if the colon gets really big and really inflamed. This can also cause bloody diarrhea and vomiting as well. Your colon is essentially no longer passing stool. Things are accumulating in it, and it's stretching to the point where it's about to burst. It can be very infected because, of course, your colon houses all of this bacteria, and it can be very dangerous for the person. Enterocyte death can also cause a perforation, which can lead to peritonitis. And of course, if the toxic megacolon bursts, that will also be a perforation leading to peritonitis. Again, this presents with similar symptoms. You can have bloody diarrhea and vomiting. You can also have abdominal pain with peritoneal signs. So you can end up with a very rigid abdomen or a pain when you just push on the bed or the table just a little bit um, because the patient has all of this gut bacteria spill out into their peritoneum. This, of course, can lead to sepsis, and sepsis can lead to septic shock. So these two are the more serious complications here at the top that can lead to sepsis and septic shock. Once the patient's in shock, they can present with typical shock symptoms. So hypotension, almost by definition. Of course, fever can get much worse. High heart rate and high breathing rate, tachycardia and tachypnea, can present as well in complications of C. diff. 
This has been a short overview of C. difficile infection. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.